Greetings from Cooperstown, New York, and welcome once again to the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. This is a special edition of our virtual Voices of the Game series, and it's a celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues with former Major League star C.C. Sabathia. For those of you, uh, you who don't know me, my name is Bruce Marcus, and I work in the Education Department here at the Hall of Fame. Let me give you a little bit of background on CC. It's an impressive resume. Over the course of a 19-year career, CC won 251 games. He earned six All-Star Game selections, won the 2007 American League Cy Young Award, and very importantly, he was also a member of the 2009 World Champion New York Yankees. CC, it's a pleasure to have you on. Welcome to the program. How you doing? Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. You're adjusting well to life away from the pitching mound, right? Oh, yeah. I, I knew about five years ago that I'd be really good at retirement. <laughs> so I got a good routine. I'm locked in with my family. Um, you know, I have four kids, so uh, they keep me busy. And, and uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a blessing to be able to play 19 years, obviously, and then to be able to retire on my own terms. Um, you know, I, I have no regrets, and, and I'm not looking back. I'm looking forward. So it's been great. I just reviewed some of the highlights of your career, and a lot of people are familiar with that, especially Yankee fans who remember the second half of your career and your being a, such a major part of that 2009 championship team. What some people may not be aware is your incredible, your remarkable interest in the Negro Leagues. This year, 2020, marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Negro Leagues. It was done in 1920 by Hall of Famer Rube Foster. He started a league called the Negro National League, and that marked the start of what we now refer to as Negro Leagues Baseball. CC, so when did you first become aware of the history of the Negro Leagues? Was this something you heard about as a young child, or did this come later for you after you started playing baseball at a more competitive level? No, that's something that I learned as a young kid. Um, you know, my grandfather, both my grandfathers on my mom and dad's side were baseball fans, and you know, they were Brooklyn Dodger fans. So it made them Dodger fans. And, you know, they, they love Jackie Robinson. And, and, you know, obviously me having an interest in baseball from the time I was four years old, um, I automatically, you know, got my lesson on the Negro Leagues. You know, not like an extensive one like I got when I was older, but just introduced to it and, and understanding why I'm able to play the game and, you know, able to, to, to live out my dream. Um, my grandparents made, made sure that, I understood what the Negro Leagues meant to us as, as a black community and, and, you know, what it meant to me to be able to, to live my dream out and, and, and really help my family in a way that, you know, I probably wouldn't have been able to do, you know, before 1947. Your grandparents went to Negro Leagues games? Uh, my, my grandfather did, yeah. yeah. Um, um, he grew up in Mississippi, um, and, and he did go to a lot of games, my, my grandfather on my, on my mom's side. Did he have a particular team that he followed or he, he just liked it in general? He just liked it in general. He would always talk, tell me about players from, you know, uh, Bullet Joe Rogan to uh, Cool Papa Bill. And, you know, when, when, as I got older, I became a huge, huge Satchel Page fan. Um, obviously, me getting drafted by the Indians, learning that he won the Rookie of the Year with the Indians, um, you know, just kind of just – I just naturally gravitated towards him. So – you know, in my house around here, I have a lot of paintings and pictures of, of, uh, of Satchel Paige. It leads perfectly into my next question, because I was going to ask you about some of your favorite players from the Negro Leagues, players that you have kind of followed in retrospect. Satchel Paige is a great starting point. He was actually the first man to be elected and inducted to the Hall of Fame based on what he did in the Negro Leagues. And some people will say, hey, what about Jackie Robinson? Yes, it's true that Robinson played for the Kansas City Monarchs, but he only played one season. The reason he's in the Hall of Fame is really not because of what he did in the Negro Leagues, but everything else that he did. Mm -hmm. Satchel is in the Hall for what he did primarily as a Negro Leagues player uh, before, at the age of 42, finally getting a chance with the Cleveland Indians. Um, the guy was a great showman. Uh, he was incredibly entertaining. They used to put his name on promotional posters and broadsides whenever he was going to pitch. Yes. For those bar barnstorming exhibition games. Yes. I mean, in a lot of ways, he was the guy who economically drove the Negro Leagues. He was an attraction. He, I mean, you know, you, there's pictures of him 
with his own plane. Satchel Paige is all stars, and they're all decked out, sitting on the tarmac, getting ready to go fly and go play. So he was. I mean, he he was one of the driving force. Him, Josh, Josh Gibson, obviously. Um, but people showed up when when Satchel was pitching, and, and he put on the show every time. From you know making the players sit down in the in the infield and outfield to to you know he they said he warmed up with a gum wrapper. That he he would warm up with a gum wrapper and be able to throw the pitches to the corners and. I mean, just some of the stories that you hear about this guy was, uh, it's amazing. And, you know, just the way that he, like you said, he drove the economics of, of the Negro Leagues. You know, there were, you know, every, obviously everything was segregated. And, you know, the Negro Leagues was, was a driving force in, in the black community. Um, you know, from our own hotels to, you know, steakhouses and stuff that we could eat at. Um, you know, they had everything provided for, for the players. So um, the Negro Leagues not only was, was an opportunity for, baseball players, but it, but it drove a lot of the economics in the black communities back then. At his peak, he threw very hard. We don't know exactly how hard because they didn't have radar gun readings like today. Some estimates say that he threw close to 100 miles an hour, maybe at 100 or a little bit above. He certainly seemed to be in that neighborhood. I'm fascinated, though, by what he did at the end of his career. It was mm -hmm. his last major league appearance in a regular season game, 1965. Uh, Charlie Finley signs him for the Kansas City A's. He's 59 years of age, comes out of the bullpen and shuts out the Boston Red Sox for three innings. <laughs> it is incredible. And, and, you know, like, if you go to the Negro Leagues uh, Museum, his, they got a tombstone in there of him, but nobody really knew his age. Nobody, because nobody knew the year that he was born. Everybody obviously knew the year he passed away. But we don't really know if he was 42 at the time that he won the rookie of the year. He could have been 45. He could have been 46. Nobody, nobody knew. There's no record of, of his birth. So uh, it's it's uh, it's incredible, you know, how long that man pitched and and you know putting on the show in the Negro leagues and in the big leagues. Now you just turned 40 in July. Congratulations mm -hmm. on that milestone. Thank you. So we'll expect in 19 years you'll make a comeback with some team and come out of the bullpen. <laughs> My shoulder's broke. <laughs> but if if not, if, if, I, if I didn't get hurt at the end of last season, um, I'd definitely be pitching out of the bullpen right now, hopefully for the – I mean, you know, presumably for the Yankees. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I was just blessed with one of those arms until, until, it, until it broke, you know, my last pitch against the Astros last year. But – um, yeah, I definitely was, was looking forward to maybe extending my career a little bit and trying to pitch out of the bullpen. Well, with all these new surgeries coming up, who knows what they'll be able to do to <laughs> that return nearly 20 years from now. Paige, of course, a right-handed pitcher. Were there any left-handed pitchers in the Negro Leagues that you've studied and maybe you know, heard about and reminded you of yourself? You know what? To be honest, no, I haven't. I, and that's something maybe I should, I should look up and get into. Um, you know, I'm really close with Bob Kendrick. I had a great relationship with Buck O'Neill. He was the one who brought me to the museum and, and really introduced me to my education as far as um, everything is, you know, being older as, as a baseball player. Um, but no, I haven't. You know, I was, I'm just so engulfed in Satchel Paige. And, um, but, but that's a good point. I should look up uh, if, there, if there were any other lefties, uh, you know, at the time that, that, I, that I can look to and, and, and read about for sure. You mentioned a moment ago Josh Gibson, arguably the greatest hitter, certainly the greatest power hitter in the Negro Leagues. What have you learned about him over the years? Like you said, he was just a great hitter. Um, but, but obviously a, a, a power hitter, we know. But they just said he was to hit the ball all over the field, power to all fields, um, you know, great behind the plate, um, and would have been, uh, you know, great in, the, in MLB, you know, had he gotten a shot. So... Um, it's just sad that he passed away so early and didn't get a chance to um, really live out his full potential as a, as a, I mean, he did in the Negro Leagues, but, you know, to live out the full potential as a, as a big league player. Yeah, he died from a brain tumor January of 1947, only three months before, before. Uh, Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. You mentioned Buck O'Neill. I had the, the privilege and pleasure of interviewing him in our grandstand theater uh, back in 2000. Uh, he was amazing. He was everything I was led to believe. Uh, you mentioned that you got a chance to know him quite well. Favorite story of Buck O'Neill? Oh, man. My favorite story of Buck. My favorite story of Buck would just be me. My, my very first um, 
time in Kansas City. I'm 20 years old. We show up in Kansas City. I'm walking out to BP. Um, you know, it's my first year in the big leagues. I don't think anybody's going to know me. Um, and he's standing behind the cage and he yells, hey, big fella, come over here. And, you know, he just started talking to me. He's like, hey, I've been watching you. You know, you got a great fastball and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Buck O'Neill is like, knows who I am. And he's been, you know, he's been watching me. But that just let me know how, um, how much we need to take care of each other as a black community, as black players and, and support each other. And, and it, my, my love for the Negro Leagues just kind of grew from there. My love for him and Bob and, and really just wanting to see, um, you know, black players do well. And, and you know, he kind of started that for me. And that was just my very first introduction to him. And the next day, he, you know, that day he told me to, about, the, about the museum. The next day I went and visited, had soul food. And, and that just became uh, a part of my routine every time I went to Kansas City. And I played in Cleveland for a long time. So we went there three times a year. So uh, it was always a stop of mine. And, and even when I got to New York, I'm taking different players and, and uh, you know, just kind of showing them that experience. A lot of things are amazing about Buck O'Neill, maybe at the top of the list. He never seemed bitter. He, mm -hmm. in. he was excluded from the major leagues. Uh, he never had a chance to play uh, in the majors, didn't have a chance to manage in the majors, even though he was a terrific field manager with the Kansas City Monarchs. Never, never a note of bitterness in anything he said. No, not, not, not at all. Never any regret, never any bitterness, and just always looking forward to the next generation. Always looking forward to guys being able to pay it forward. And, and that's just the spirit of the museum and, and, and the, the Negro Leagues is, you know, paying it forward. And, and that's something that, you know, he was really passionate about and, and, um, and, and didn't really care about, you know, getting to play in the, in the MLB or managing the MLB. He wanted to us, for us to live our dream out, which is awesome, you know. Have there been any other Negro Leagues players that you've been able to meet over the years? Um... I mean, no. I know we, we had a big banquet in 2007 um, when they used to have the awards, um, you know. But but no, I haven't I haven't got, had a chance to uh, to meet any any players besides you know Hank Aaron and um, I think Willie May. Did Willie Mays play in the Negro yeah, Leagues? He did. Um, so obviously getting a chance to meet those two and meeting Buck, um, you know, are probably the players that that I know the best. Well, he played for the Birmingham Black Barons for a number of years, and Hank Aaron played for the Indianapolis Clowns, actually came up as a shortstop before the Braves uh, moved him to the outfield full-time. And uh, two of our uh, living Hall of Famers among the uh, Negro League alumni, even though they're not known for the Negro Leagues, they certainly did play there at the beginning of their professional careers. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit, CC, about life back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, neither of you or I were around back then, but how do you think you personally would have dealt with this incredibly difficult situation of segregated baseball? How do you think you would have reacted? How do you think you would have handled it? I don't think I was the person, I, I'm, I'm not the person to, that would have been able to handle it well. I'm super emotional um, and, and I kind of, I'll just fly off the cusp, you know what I mean? So. Um, that's why, and that's honestly why I have so much respect for Jackie, uh, for being able to break the color barrier um, and, and, you know, give me an opportunity to play and deal with everything that he had to deal with going through, you know, not being able to eat with his teammates, uh, you know, having different locker rooms, you know, just, just different things, staying at different hotels. Um, that, that's, that's rough. Um, in the Negro Leagues, I, I feel like I may have been able to, to do it just because it was – it, it was the league. It was all of us. It was our thing. So um, I think that would have been a little a little easier for me to handle. But but trying to break the color barrier or or being one of those first guys, Larry Doby, Jackie Robinson, uh, I, I know one thousand percent I wouldn't have been able to handle that. So uh, that's why I have so much respect for 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 Rachel and you know his family and and, and the Jackie Robinson Foundation. Um, I do whatever I can um, because I wouldn't be sitting here and living out my dream. My family wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for him. So if Branch Rickey, the general manager of the Dodgers, had approached you and said to you, like he said to Jackie, you cannot fight back, you cannot lose your temper for three full seasons, I guess you would have said you may need to find someone else. You may need to find someone else. I'll go back to the Negro Leagues. After 1950, after those three full seasons, then I'll, I'll be able to come back. But that I, I, I wouldn't have been the person to be able to handle that. 
How about when you played? Obviously a different era, but we certainly see evidence of racism that's still out there today. It may be more subtle, it may be less overt in many ways. Were there times during your minor league, your major league career, uh, where you really felt quite clearly that you were being targeted because of your skin color? It could have, I'm not asking you to name names, but yeah. it could have been somebody um, within your organization, it could have been an opposing player, could have been fans. Did that, did that happen from time to time? It happened from time to time, and it, and it was players on my team, and it was fans. Um, you know, earlier in my career, um, obviously, like you said, I don't want to name names, but yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, um, it just kind of is what it is. I mean, I, I told Dontrell Willis just the other day, um, those times that I dealt with the racism in the game and all that stuff, it still sticks with me. You know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, that's a tough thing to have somebody judge you or, or, you know, not like you because of the color of your skin and not get to know you. That, that's a hard thing for me to, to, to grasp. You know, I grew up in California in the Bay Area and, and it's super diverse. I grew up with, with everybody. So, I, you know, I didn't, I never had that prejudice until I got to the big leagues, until I was, you know, warming up in the bullpen or, you know, doing different things out on the field. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that was a tough thing for me to handle for sure. I would think coming from a teammate would be especially difficult. I mean, it's all difficult no matter who it comes from. Yeah. But from one of your teammates, a guy who's supposed to be on your side, you're supposed to be on the same side of the battle, how did you handle it when one of your own teammates is giving you a hard time? Yeah, I mean, I was young. It was a different big leagues than it is now, you know, when I first came up. So, um, you know, you don't – you you, you, you just – you kind of just take it at that point, you know, when you're young. Um, but but I was able to to stand up for myself at some point and, and – um, you know, kind of, kind of get get that person off me, and 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 after that point, I, I felt comfortable in the club. Up until that point, I didn't like going to the field. I didn't want to be around the clubhouse. I would come late and just show up and you know do my thing. But you know, after I was able to stand up for myself and you know kind of fight back, it it uh, it, it kind of eased everything for me. CC, we have a number of kids watching these programs online from the Hall of Fame. For the kids who are watching today. They might have little to no knowledge of the Negro Leagues coming in. Why is it important for us to take the time to remember these leagues that originated a century ago? I think it's important because some of your favorite players wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Negro Leagues. We just named two, Hank Aaron and Willie Mays, two of the greatest players to ever play. Um, so, you know, the history of the game kind of goes with the history of the Negro Leagues. And I think people – really need to pay attention to, uh, to what it was and, and, how, and how big it was. And, and, and for me, you know, I see pictures of people, how they used to dress up and decked out to go to the games. Like it was, it was, it was the, the thing to do, you know, in the black community. So um, I, I think it's some cool stories to be told. I think, you know, people be fascinated by a lot of the stuff that went on back then. And, you know, Satchel Paige having his own plane. In, in the 30s and 40s, like, come on, man. Like, who was doing that? So um, I, I, think it's, I think it's just super cool. And I think if you're a baseball fan, uh, you should 1,000% get to know uh, some of these players and characters from the Negro League. We feature an educational program here at the Hall of Fame that we do both online and also for school groups that visit Cooperstown. It's called Civil Rights Before You Could Say Jackie Robinson. And toward the end of the program, we always show the kids a photograph of three players, uh, two African-American, one Latino. You have Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, the Latino is Roberto Clemente. And I always tell the kids, I grew up with baseball in the early 70s. That's when I was their age. And for me to try to imagine baseball without the baseball royalty of Mays, Aaron, and Clemente, it's just hard for me to fathom the game without their contributions. But you think about it, if Robinson had failed, if he had struggled and gotten released, I mean, eventually the game would have integrated, but it would have been so delayed. Yeah. Maybe those three great players, they don't set the records that they do. They, they want that. If Jackie doesn't not only not react to everything people are calling him and saying and doing, but to go out and actually be a great baseball player, if he doesn't do that, 
then there is no Willie Mays in, in the MLB. There is no Hank Aaron in the MLB. Like, he set the table for all of these guys. So, you know, even for me looking, you know, when I was watching the game growing up in the 80s, I, I grew up a big A's fan. It was Ricky Henderson, Dave Stewart, Dave Parker. Um, you know, it was, it, was guy, it was guys that looked like me, that, that I could watch. And, and if, if not for Jackie, I, I wouldn't be playing baseball because I wouldn't have stepped on the mound and tried to, and tried to imitate Dave Stewart. You know, so um, I think that's a super important point for people to understand how much he had on him. You know, it was he, I mean, everybody's dreams landed on Jackie's shoulders, you know, from, from now until baseball ends. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, it's, it's, an, incredible, it's an incredible thing that he did opening up the, the, the gate for us, for sure. Let's talk a little bit about the work that you're doing with this clothing line that people may not be aware of, but we want to make them aware of it. You've partnered with an organization. It is called Roots of Fight. Mm -hmm. Also partnered with the Players Association. And you've created a clothing line featuring Negro Leagues jerseys, also jackets and hoodies. Tell us more about that and how fans can purchase these items if they'd like to. Yeah, so uh, I got a chance to um, partner up with Roots of Fight um and 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 make some cool pieces for the the centennial for the 100th year of the negro leagues um and you know like i said like we've talked about the negro leagues are so near and dear to my heart um you know it being the, the 100th year and me knowing what roots of fight what type of stories they tell the 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 people that they have under you know they have jackie robinson they have uh muhammad ali malcolm x um, so they, they tell these great stories. So I thought it would be a perfect um, marriage for us to, to, to come together and, you know, make some, some awesome, you know, clothing for, you know, people to, to really pay homage to, to the Negro Leagues. And it's been going great. You know, all the players have been wearing it. Um, you know, people have been buying it. You can go to rootsofight.com. Um, you know, um, some of the proceeds are going to the Negro League players, families um, that are still alive. So um it, it's, it's just a great it was just a great marriage it's been a it's been a it's been an awesome experience to be able to do this and um you know i think everybody that knows me knows how much i um admire the guys that played the negro leagues in that museum and my love for bob and buck um you know are just coming through through these coping pieces my understanding is that you're really helping create them or you have helped create them are you using the original logos and colors from the Negro Leagues, or are you doing different types of things? We're doing different types of things, but we have a, a cool logo. Uh, we're using a lot of the same colors. Um, you know, I, I want to get into telling different stories. I want to get Josh Gibson. I want to get Hank Aaron. I want to get, um, you know, all these different players to make these pieces to bring them back to life, the cool Papa Bells. Um, you know, I, I think it would be awesome to be able to, to tell these stories again and get people, um, you know, interested in, in the Negro League Museum like I am. Now, the backs of the jerseys, do they feature some of the player names? Uh, no, it's just a number. So we have like a, we have a, a, a baseball tee, like a tee, like a tee ball tee, and yeah. it's got Jackie Robinson, it's got his uh, Kansas City Marduk number. Um, we have two t-shirts, uh, Jackie Robinson with five on the back. Um, we have a Negro League logo that we made with the 100th year on it. Um, we have a hoodie. We got more shorts coming out, a tank top, a bag. Um, so there will be a lot more pieces for people to, um, to, uh, to, to pay homage to, to these guys. Well, actually, not having the names on the backs of the uh, jerseys is more accurate because none of the Negro Leagues players. They didn't, yeah. Name. That didn't start till 1960 with Bill Beck and the White Sox. And by then, the Negro Leagues had, had pretty much faded away. Uh, so, again, the website is rootsoffight.com. Again, that's yes. R-O-O-T-S of fight.com. And you can purchase uh, jerseys, jackets, hoodies. Did I get out all the clothing or are there any yeah. other? Yeah, shorts, tank tops, and they got, they got bags coming too. Very good. Well, we wish you the best of luck with that. Uh, proceeds going to some of the former players and I believe the Negro Leagues Museum, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. Yep. I want to talk a little bit before we let you go about um, some of your own clothing that you have worn. You donated a number of years ago to the Hall of Fame a jersey from your 3,000th career strikeout, uh, April 30th, 2019. 
What does it mean to have a piece of your clothing here at the museum? Oh, that's incredible. Um, I mean, I don't know if people know where I'm from. You know, I'm from Vallejo, California. Um, I grew up in the hood. I grew up in the inner city. I grew up in this uh, uh, area of this city called the Crest. Um, so for me to, I just got goosebumps. For me to have a piece of my clothing, like something that I did in the major leagues, in the Hall of Fame is incredible. I, I never, I never, I couldn't even dream that big, if that makes sense. I couldn't dream big enough to think about the Hall of Fame. My focus had to be on just making it, you know, just making it to the big leagues, like, was just a huge accomplishment for me. So to be able to play 19 seasons, to be able to play for the, the best organization in the world, um, you know, come here in the Bronx and pitch, uh, it's been, a, it's like a dream. It's been incredible. And, and to have, you know, a piece of my, you know, have one of my jerseys in the Hall of Fame, uh, it's, it's, it's just, it's hard for me to think about. Like, I've never been to Cooperstown. I pitched in that, in that uh, Hall of Fame game, but I've never been to the museum. So, I'm definitely looking forward to getting up there and, and check it out where the jersey is because uh, that's incredible. You know, I, I never even pitched in to, to – I couldn't even think that big, you know. So um, it's, it's definitely been a blessing. You've given some other items too. Shoes worn during the home opener of the new Yankee Stadium back in 2009. Uh, shoes and glove that you wore for your 200th career win July 3rd, 2013 and also a baseball from career strike at number 3003. And that was just last year as well, May 6th, 2019. So we, uh, we certainly appreciate your generosity and um, uh, glad to hear that when the Hall of Fame came up to you and asked for an item, you, uh, you said yes without uh, hesitation. Yeah, who's gonna say no to the Hall of Fame? <laughs> you know, it's, it's better there than a, in a box somewhere, you know, at, at somebody's house. So. Uh, it's just incredible that they would even come and, and consider me to put a piece there. So that's that's awesome. Do you keep a lot of items from your career with you as well? Um, I have a few. Like I have, you know, I have some some things that, you know, I have some things from Derek, from Andy, from um, from Mo. Um, a lot of my stuff, I have just like a lot of cleats. Obviously, I had, you know, was, was with Jordan for 12 years of my career. So I have a lot of um, like cool cleats that I keep. Um, but other than that, not really. A lot of my jerseys and stuff I've given away, my gloves and stuff, um, you know, I'll let other people enjoy them. Well, we really appreciate your time, CeCe, and I, I have to say that, uh, well, a couple of things I want to say. First of all, you look great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you've lost some weight before, but it looks like you've lost additional weight since we last saw you on the mound, so congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, and of course, the other thing from, from my standpoint, this is a bit of a special thing I was mentioning to you before. Uh, I'm one of the Yankee fans uh, here on the staff at the Hall of Fame. Awesome. Of people I work with are not Yankee fans, so just keep that. <laughs> it's a uh, objective, but it's not always that easy. Nah, like I said, I grew up an A's fan, so I definitely understand. Uh, but I appreciate you, you, know, you, us, you supporting us. And being a longtime fan since 1972, you got all the history, so that's awesome. Again, uh, the website is rootsoffight.com. Mm -hmm. Go there and look at um, some of the many different uh, pieces of apparel that CC has helped design, Negro Leagues memorabilia uh, that is available for purchase. Uh, rootsoffight.com, the major leagues, uh, both uh, the American League and National League, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the start of Negro Leagues Baseball. It started 1920 by Hall of Famer Rube Foster. Cece, we really appreciate it. Best of luck with the clothing line and your continued work as an advisor with the Yankees. Thank you, thank you, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Our guest has been former Major League standout Cece Sabathia talking about the centennial anniversary of the beginning of Negro Leagues Baseball. We hope you enjoyed this program delivered from Cooperstown, New York, and delivered from CeCe's home as well. Uh, thanks for being with us. Have a great day, everybody.